This break is brought to you by Netflix. Head on over to Netflix.com slash GameBreakerTV to sign up for a free 30-day trial. With very little announcement, ArenaNet developers Eric Flanham and Colin Johansson did a special Twitch TV live stream this afternoon where a major bomb has just been dropped. With me to talk a little bit about this is GameBreaker writer Jason Winter. Now, Jason, we just heard it from ArenaNet's mouth. Legendaries have indeed been confirmed for Guild Wars 2, and they're really kind of setting themselves up to be, well, uh, legendary for that matter. Um... It, legendaries are kind of a controversial topic to, to be introduced to a game. There's there's always some debates that go over who should get them and when, but it kind of seems like ArenaNet is, is kind of setting up them the and taking a different approach to, to how to get these iconic items, aren't they? Well, well, a controversial topic for you, World of Warcraft players. <laughs> Not so much for us more mature, more enlightened Guild Wars players. Uh, but yeah, they are, you know, just like in any game, you know, they are going to take it it effort from the user. It's going to be a little different maybe than how, like you said, just raiding the big boss and, you know, getting the lucky drop or whatever. Uh, they're going to require lots of, they can, there are some that can be found in dungeons and so on, but they also, different ways you can get, get them is by uh, getting, gathering up lots of different components from different places. Um, you have to get them yourself. You can't rely on other players. They're not things that are going to be auctionable or, or uh, whatever it's called, trading, trading postable, tradable, and, that sort of thing. And that's what really kind of makes this so interesting is, there, is they're taking an approach to, to an item, a, a legendary item that you can take over the course of time. You still get that legendary experience of, of doing what you can to, to seek out this amazing and powerful item, but you can do it by yourself. If that's well, where you want to spend your focus in the game, you can take the time and spend the effort to go and get a legendary item on your own. Um, there you go again, you WoW player. Talk about how powerful they're going to be. Oh. Up, up. I, I, up I, I didn't mention. No, I didn't mention. I didn't mention. Powerful. I didn't mention the state of, of powerful. But there's there's a, there is a level of prestige. But that does beg the question: Is is power going to become yeah. a sort of uh, of issue because players will be able to to grab the item on their own? No, because they're they're not going to be more powerful. They're going to be, you know, and have more or less equivalent to game stats to whatever's already in the game, maybe with a different effect or something like that. Uh, but they're not going to be any more powerful. They're going to be based off be based off specific exotic weapons, power wise. Uh, but they're just going to look a whole lot cooler. They're going to you know, they're going to have like what you said. They're going to have that prestige element as opposed to being a power element. So even if I invest all my time and whatever into doing this, it's not going to translate over to an in-game advantage. It's just going to make it make it look better, make it look cooler, and make me look cooler by extension. Not that I don't look cool enough as it is. Of course not. Of course not. You're Jason Winter. Yeah. You're the coolest of the cats. But Hell yeah. um, that taking that approach lets them kind of um, approach how they want to have legendaries equipped um, and what it may potentially do for the player. So they've, they've really kind of just taken out all the stops in terms of uh, making these legendaries aesthetically pleasing and amazing. Um, so so what, what uh, they talked a little bit about them. They gave us some examples. What were some of your favorites that they talked about? Yeah, well, they talked about a bow that shoots rainbows or, or something like that. It has a rainbow trail. Uh, they said, rainbow to the face. I don't know if they were joking, but they said like a rainbow trail with a unicorn head. Uh, that could be a joke, but I wouldn't put it past them. You know, I, I ju like judging by their tone, ones. I don't think it was a I don't think it was a joke at all. I'm I'm, I'm picturing oh, really? a a unicorn bow like with a with a, a unicorn head right where the arrow comes out, and you're gonna shoot your arrow, and it's gonna leave a rainbow trail. I and, I completely expect that to be in the game. The, impale the bad guy with the horn. Yes, I completely expect that to be in the game. I, I and that's awesome. That's so that's legendary. That's that that's what makes a legendary fun and cool. Carver. You have to kill 50 unicorns to make it happen. <laughs> so they're integrating a part of, uh, uh, part of Whimsy Shire in there. Yeah, Whimsy Shire. There you go, exactly. Uh, another another one they had, which sounds great to us, you know, old hammer warriors from Guild Wars, a hammer called the Juggernaut, which they said it looks like it has a ball of liquid metal that spreads to your character, so you leave like little metal footsteps behind, like Robert Patrick in uh, Terminator 2. I think it was it wasn't it Eric Flanham who had kind of referred to this as the uh, the Iron Man hammer. So it makes me yeah, wonder if aesthetically, yeah. like maybe maybe the colors are are like the Iron Man character, the comic book character, or or it it's kind maybe of a red and gold motif. Yeah, I mean maybe or maybe it kind of gives it dawns you because they said it affects the the aesthetic look of your entire character. So maybe it it equips you in in kind of a very armoristic kind of uh, fashion or or um, nature. Yeah. 
they'd probably leave that for the armor. I could totally see them having like a heavy armor Iron Man type set to go with it. That that would be cool. That I would absolutely go in for. Now, the, the the other legendary that they mentioned is one that I'm really excited about. I was really happy to hear this is coming to Great Swords because if you guys watched my my Warrior top five weapons for Warriors, the Great Sword was was my number one. And there's going to be effectively two Great Swords: one that represents day, one that represents night, and those are legendaries in themselves. On top of that, if you get both of them, you can then combine them into a super legendary that will shift between day and night and, and kind of change the, the way and make your make your sword look like the sky, I think they said. I, I didn't quite understand what they were talking about, but yeah, I mean I could yeah. I mean look like the sky I, I don't know, man. That's a legend. Uh, that's a legendary weapon. That's a legendary weapon. I can't imagine the amount of time and excitement it's going to take to get this item. And 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 what 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 stinks, but I'm super excited because, like I said, this is an item that I'm going to take the time to to try and get for myself. Is that it's 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 too legendary quest lines that are going to take a massive itself, yeah. amount of time to get on top of the fact that once you probably get both of them it's probably not just a a click one and combine them both you probably have to do another quest line on top of that to go and get this master legendary weapon which is just an interesting and awesome idea i can't yeah, wait to get my hands on this sword they said it's going to be the hardest one to get and i can believe that probably means i'm not even going to bother trying <laughs> if, but, I have a, I have a, if i have a warrior or a mesmer i'm going to be like you know I, I I can't do it. But that's the best part is is you don't you don't like you you have to try you have to put forth effort to get it. But I can sure. do it on my own. Like I don't need to to have twenty four or nine other people to take me into a raid or a dungeon. I'm sure there's probably dungeons that you have to go into. But they made it sound like it's something that I can do on my own personal time. And sure, it might take me a year or two years, or or it might take the fastest people to farm it out one week to do but the sure. the idea is that that if i if that is what i want to do in guild wars if i want to go get my legendary great sword i can spend the time and go do that on my own so i'm not exactly certain that that was what they meant it almost sounded more like when they said do it on your own i think i thought they meant more like being a thing where you can't you know in terms of trading or, or like auction housing or whatever i don't know that this necessarily meant you could solo through it because they do talk about having legendaries in dungeons which you'll obviously need to have people for so yeah, at the worst, you're looking at maybe five-man groups or something like that, or some big uh, dynamic events to kill like super elite bosses, which you can do with other people. Right, I mean, and those are smart. those are so easy in terms of time works, investment. Because yeah, because it, 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 yeah. it's it's one thing to be able to jump into a dungeon and go run it to get your quest done, but it's a completely other thing to have to have a reliable raid schedule to farm up yeah. items to craft your biggest thing and then debate over who gets the items in the raid. If it's something that you can just kind of do on your own. You 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 skip the middleman. Yeah, exactly. That that I imagine a large portion of it at least is going to be available through dynamic events, with some other stuff being available in dungeons. But as long as you can get most of it through the big dynamic events or, or from or which we'll talk about later, uh, that'll be that'll be really great. Now they also go on to talk a little bit about uh, additional loot and how they're going to handle it in the game, and and you can essentially achieve the best gear through different options of of the direction you want to play your game. Correct. Right, right. I mean, again, other, other than the weapons, of course, they're going to be elite armor, so you look really cool all dressed up. Uh, there's going to be different stuff you can get with karma rewards. And, uh, you know, one of the great things is once, one of the things they also they mentioned is once you get to level 80, you're going to keep leveling and getting more skill points, which, of course, you can use for skills, but you can also combine stuff in the Mystic Forge. Uh, I, I don't, I didn't, uh, again, I was trying to work it all throughout. I only barely touched the Mystic Forge when I went in the last beta. So I was trying to figure out, apparently, you, you know, use skill points to combine with the items. Uh, you can use skill points to transmute materials, get new items and so on. So, you know, it's going to be something, it's definitely going to give you a reason to do something after you hit level 80. You'll definitely want to go through to, to gain skill points to get all this other cool stuff as well. And I think that's what's really exciting and important here is, is they talked about the idea of what players can can look forward to after they finish their personal story and hit level 80 mm -hmm. because Endgame is, is such a really big deal for every MMO player and it's something that a lot of players have been kind of worried about with the model that Guild Wars 2 was taking. Yeah, I know. I, I think I actually did a column on it a, a month or two ago. Where I was like, you know, all this sounds good, and I've been playing in the beta, and it's fun, but, you know, like, at, at some point, you stop leveling. you got to figure out, what do I do now? And in traditional MMO, that's you know, maybe raiding, PvP, whatever, you know, but they weren't going to have that. you still got to figure out, well, what are you going to do? Are you just going to run dungeons? Are you just going to, you know, do dynamic events? And that is true. You are still going to do that sort of thing, but they really, I think, 
gave us a lot of ideas as to what you're going to do and how you're not going to be you're not going to be bored after a couple of weeks or a couple of months of being at level 80 and you're not going to just go around wondering what you're going to do can you give us some insight on on what their ideas were for for people to spend their time doing after they hit level 80 or like they they, they seem to be very heavy advocates of once you're 80 you can go back and enjoy the content that you missed along the way you can go play with your friends that started a new character with the character that you want to play you don't have to go re-roll yeah, well, I mean, when, when I first talked to these guys, like about a year and a half ago, I did an interview with them for the magazine. Uh, they all they sold me pretty much when they said, when you get to eighty, you, you, the game doesn't change. Most MMOs, you get to max level, you have to stop doing your solo stuff, your little quests, whatever. You got to go into the big raids, or maybe you got to go into the big PvP ring. That's the only way to advance, and that's great that you don't have to do that here. That like that, that practically sold me on the game right there. They said, you know, we don't want you to play a different game or be forced to play a different game when you reach level 80. And yeah, as Eric Flanham said, people mistake that for a lack of end game, that because we don't force you down this certain line that's been done all the time, that we don't have anything for you. You can keep doing everything you enjoyed to get to level 80 at level 80. What uh, what what did he mention? Because because there's also a big thing that they're doing here with with ore, and that's supposed to make a really distinct experience for for players at level eighty. What's going on there? Yeah, ore is like the the risen city that that came up through the waters and the you know, flooded lines arch, and just it's where the it's where Jaitan, I believe, hangs out, the big elder dragon, his hordes of zombies or whatever. And it's it's a really distinct place. Collins Rance really went into great detail on this. This is kind of details I don't think we had before, and it's really, really interesting the way you discussed it. It's it's much more focused on the events, the dynamic events. There are no renowned hearts, because being the big city overrun by undead, not a whole lot of, you know, friendly farmers to help out and, you know, <laughs> pick their apples for them. Like <laughs> no, no, no one's just hanging out in a, a town of zombies maybe, looking maybe for... There's a, maybe there's a zombie farmer and there are rotten apples, but let's just figure that's not going to be there. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be all about events, n nothing but dynamic events. The story is going to be focused on very large meta events, taking key locations, uh, fighting your way in, and controlling areas. They talk about how to get in. There's going to be like three landings on the beachhead: the northern assault path. Uh, you get in by sea and air. You'll send in golems and submarines. There's a center path where you have to have your navy and your boats and whatever. And there's a southern path where you can come along through bridges. And you have to take the. You kind of compare it to the uh, the attack on Normandy, trying to come in and take all these places under heavy fire. And then once you're inside. There, there are a bunch of event chains that'll, that'll uh, you know, you have to execute to take control of the, the god temples, which are these giant uh, like centers of the gods, the, the, the holy land from way back in history. These areas were corrupted by Zaitan, and if you control them, you'll control all these other places around there that otherwise would spring up traps and all sorts of evil things. And what's really interesting about this this whole idea of, of what they're doing with the war outside of the, the dynamic nature of it is is the fact that it's kind of opening itself into a, a, a world of questing that gives you different outcomes. They, they specifically said that a questing experience is no longer A to B, but it, it's, it's A to B, which then opens up to you know, different possibilities for you to follow either C or maybe you're going over to D and it creates a different experience and different outcomes based on, on the way that their quest system works. Yeah, they talk about, you know, how some dynamic events are, are just chains that move directly up and down. Some are just one-off things, you know, escort the caravan and that's it. Uh, and some are a little more intricate. Like you said, you, you go from point A to point B and then depending on what you do, it goes to C or to D and then from there it goes to E, F or G and, and so on and so forth. And apparently there's going to be a lot more of that in ore. In fact, he said, first of all, there's going to be more than double the, the number of dynamic events you see in a normal zone. Uh, and, you know, more complex chance of that in general as the game goes on. And a whole lot of the event webs in ore of stuff just branching out, going all over the place. I mean, he talks about, like he talked about the god temples. That the, if the Orients control these giant temples, there are these little statues all around ore that, that cause bad things to happen, like uh, roots out of the ground that snare you or stuff that you can't use healing abilities or whatever. So you have to, to, to get through to the final dungeon, you have to progress along through all that. You have to take those temples, you have to deal with all this other stuff going on, and then you can finally uh, <clears throat> raid, excuse me. Uh, Don't use that word. Oh, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Blasphemy. You, you, you and many of your friends can get together to take on the uh, final stuff in ore. Um, but but uh, or or is one thing specifically that that's doing this. But what's really exciting to see is that, that this this philosophy isn't just held to or and and we can kind of see that in, in their approach with how they're taking um, dungeons because they have eight right. dungeons at the end game. But it actually becomes a little bit more of an experience through their exploration system. Correct? 
Right. Well, the dungeons open up. I believe the first one is at level 30, and then you can get a few more as you go along, and there's a, bun a few more open at endgame. And like I said, eight total. Uh, and, you know, as we kind of know, there's explorable, there's the regular mode, the story mode, and later on there's the explorable mode where you get to choose different directions to go in the dungeon and try the different chains. But he said of those eight dungeons, there are over 25 different explorable dungeon paths. So a lot of different ways you can go in there. going to be a lot of different variety. And, of course, there's all the regular stuff. There's the structured PvP, world versus world. So between the dungeons, the PvP, or... Uh, you know, just going around and doing all the all the different stuff to gather up your legendaries and so on. It it does sound like there is just a ton of stuff to do once you get to level 80 in Guild Wars 2. Is that something that you like to see and, and experience the way that you play games? I mean, one it's one thing to have, to be able to jump in and have a lot of different options to, to play the game that you want to play, but what about the idea of the person who, who wants to get in and experience it all? Um, obviously, they're going to have to to throw in a, a massive amount of time to, to feel like they're getting the full amount of experience. Um, or do you think that they're they're really not missing out just because each experience is, is as fleshed out as it is? Well, you know, it'd be, it's it's going to be hard to get all that stuff done with, with you know trying to cram in all your time with that monthly fee. So, oh wait a second. Oh, oh wait oh, a second. No. You're, oh, right. you're, okay. you're just buying the box. I have plenty of time to do everything, but yeah, I mean, it, it is great that there's going to be so much variety and, like I said, it's going to be it's opened up kind of in layers as you go along. Like you'll you'll be able to do more and more, more dungeons, more complex dynamic events, and the stuff's kind of all thrown at you little by little. So when you finally get to 80 and you finally have everything, you know, that you can look at and you can go do, it might not it doesn't seem that overwhelming. It seems like a lot, so it is quite a bit, but it doesn't seem like you know when you play a normal game, you you get to 80. Or you get to the max level or whatever it is, and suddenly, bang! Here's there's a 50 person, 40 person raid. It's like, well, where did that come from? I've never done this before. How do I do this? Sure. Or here's here's a, a new war zone or whatever. It's like, what? Where did? What? How? What? How? So it's it, it's cool how they're doing that. How just you just kind of do stuff as you go along, and once you get to the end, it's all there, and you've kind of been doing it as you go along anyway. Now, what about? On the level of, of, of personal progression, because once you hit level 80, that's that's the end. You're not getting any more levels. What's what's the point of continuing to try and grind out these these skill points if you're not gaining any more levels? Yep. Once you hit level 80, you actually have to uninstall the game and never play again. Never play it again. And just just quit. The suggestion. That's why there's no subscription models, because once you hit 80, it's exactly. over. Exactly. <laughs> You'll all be there within a week. It'll be fine. Uh, no, well, just like in Guild Wars 1, you, know, you keep gaining experience after you hit you know, level 20 in Guild Wars 1, and once you get to 80 in this, you know, you'll have your bar, and it'll still keep going up. And you know, anything you do that gains you XP will contribute. So you can do your PvP or your dungeons or even just the exploration, doing that stuff, or the experience points you get from crafting or whatever. Um, and you, as you, as in Guild Wars One, every time you gain a level, you'll still gain skill points. For, you know, so there are, I think you said, uh, like it'll take like 170 skill points to unlock all the skills that a typical class would have. Uh, but of course, if you, if you think about it, you're only going to get like 70 through leveling. Sure. But then there are going to be you know, there's like 200 skill challenges. So you've got a lot available to you that you can go through and you can do all this stuff. And you and if you don't want to do the skill challenges, like, hey, you just keep doing the stuff, you just keep leveling like you normally would. And, and this is just, something just going at it. This is something that helps entice players to go back and, and play with their high level characters to their friends mm -hmm. that are just starting out. Because let's say I, I quested and, and it went through, you know, the entire West continent um, and, and then decided that, you know, my friend ended up playing a Norn, I can go in and over and help him and, and kind of experience the, the skill challenges that are over in that area and, and still be benefiting from it. I'm not only just helping and getting the opportunity to, to play with my friend who, who is new to the game, but I'm actually benefiting from it because I, I'm gaining stuff after I've hit max level. Yeah, that's a great thing. Normally, if you make a, a new character and you know I want to play with you, I'm going to have to make a new character to go along with them, and and it'll actually to actually gain anything from it. Whereas here, you know, I can my guy will be leveled down to like level five or whatever, and I'll still gain XP. Maybe I'll find some skill challenges that I haven't seen before. I'll gain skill points just by going through the stuff. So yeah, you definitely you still gain everything. And you know, one of the other cool things that Colin Trahanson said is, you know, they really are going to be good at putting new stuff in the game. So you know, he says they really have the freedom to go back to the world and tuck in extra little dynamic events that go on and they're gonna have really great support to support the game after it's launched. So even if I even if I played a Norn already and I come back to play with your little Norn, I might run into things that I haven't seen before because they put new stuff in or as we know it might be a different uh, part of a dynamic event popping up that I haven't encountered before. So 
you know, in addition to just you know gaining stuff and you know getting loot or, or skill points or whatever, I might actually find different stuff to do while I'm helping you level your your little guy. So. Now, was there anything else? Uh, it was about a 20-minute Q&A. Was there anything that we didn't cover yet that that really kind of stood out uh, as something that's groundbreaking that they're trying to bring to the game? Well, it's kind of neat. Some of the questions they feel. I mean, they wanted someone asked about uh, how hard it is to make a dynamic event versus a traditional quest, and Colin talked about how it's it, it, it's a lot tougher. Yeah, you know, they have to take into account, you know, when it runs, when it cleans up, uh, cleans up everything that it's done when it's done, how it interacts with everything else, how does the world change. And then, you know, after they're done programming it, it's got to be tested. You know, having done some software, you know, development in my life, I, I know how that is. It's like programming and getting the stuff in there is like 50% of the work. Right. And the other 50% of making it work right. So, so they, and they have, probably have a really good QA team. He said it was like 10 times harder to test it than it is to write it. So I, I definitely can see how that would go. And he also said, you know, someone asked about holiday events. And they're definitely going to have holiday events. Uh, but they have to figure out how some of these things, like the Mad King's Day and Winter's Day, how they work with other races. What are their takes on it? Because, of course, Guild Wars 1, you're entirely in human lands and you're dealing with humans. So what, what do the Char think of Winter's Day? They probably throw a... I'm thinking they throw a snow... A grenades packed in snow. Oh, gosh. That would probably be the that would probably be the essence of Char Winter's Day. Um, what about there? There was an, an additional question that was, you know, bosses to look out for, and they, they gave uh, they gave some pretty nice examples of, of things that that you definitely want to see. Yeah, well, I mean, they talked about the cube golem at the end of the Asura tutorial. And of course, I think it was Colin who said, "Well, I think Jaitan, you got you got to watch out for him." I was like, oh, "Yeah, maybe." So, <laughs> um, he might be. Might be important. I think, and and, and the one that, that that they talked about that, that kind of stood out for me, they, that, that they both seemed to really be on board, but didn't want to give too much away was that there. I forget where, but there was a a char boss at the end of one of the dungeons later in the game that was going to be very iconic and and worth the effort to go see him. So that's another one that they want to uh, be sure right, to I check think that's out. That's another storyline bit that we won't spoil for people, I, but I think I know what that is. Exactly. Exactly. Um. All right, well, that about does it. This this was a uh, a, a very sudden live stream here that we got from, from the Guild Wars do, uh, 2 team, which we're just going to see a massive amount of, of information like this just leak out of the woodworks as, as we come up to their final beta weekend and get closer to launch. So keep it tuned right here to Game Breaker TV. We'll keep you updated as all this information comes in. And be sure to catch Guildcast on a weekly basis, Tuesdays at 6 p.m. PDT. Jason, thank you so much for the information. Guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.